Before we get into today's episode, I just wanna tell you that Knox and Vesta, the candle shop that I own, finally is restocking some of its most popular scents. Alexandria and Tempest have been sold out for nearly a month, month and a half-ish at this point, and they are finally restocked. They should be restocked as of today. And I know Gilgamesh, we were running like almost completely out of them, but we finally got the oils we needed. So all of the candles should be restocked and ready to go. So if you wanna go check them out, make sure you go to noxvesta.com, N-O-X-V-E-S-T-A.com. Oprah Winfrey is one of the most influential women in the world. She owns the Oprah Winfrey Network, where her specials have gained tens of millions of viewers, and the Oprah Winfrey show itself was on air for 25 years. However, controversy seems to surround her. She's helped figures like Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz rise to stardom, and her show featured anti-vaxxers, and her charitable work has been criticized as being performative more than helpful. Are these things just mistakes, or is there a pattern of negligent and irresponsible behavior surrounding Oprah Winfrey? Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're gonna be talking about Oprah Winfrey. Oprah has been involved in a handful of scandals in recent years. Back in 2013, she was widely criticized for her take on racism. Her exact words to this were, "'As long as people can be judged by the color of their skin, the problem is not solved. There are still generations of people, older people, who were born and bred and marinated in it in the prejudice and racism, and they just have to die. In other words, Oprah believed that racism would not be solved until the older generations simply die off. Now, I kind of understand her viewpoint. I know she's being quite curt, and and to some people, you know, obviously it's, oh yeah, well, you're just too old to learn, so we'll just wait for you to die. I get it how that can be, you know, really hurtful to a lot of people. However, And by however, might I also add however, and unfortunately, research has shown that younger generations express racial prejudice in new ways, such as acting completely apathetic towards violence against black people, with some teens claiming that they must have done something to deserve it, a phrase that we've probably heard before. Yes, racism has changed over the years, but it's not something that just vanishes. When Jim Crow was widespread, perhaps people of that era looked back and said that they were living in an era that had marked improvements since slavery. But as we know and have discussed, that era was still full of disgusting and frightening acts of racial injustice, such as the penal labor system that many have argued is nothing more than a form of legal slavery. Racism is alive even in the younger generations. To claim that old white people have to just die off and it'll be solved is just, it's kind of a misguided statement. In 2020, she was involved in another controversy surrounding race when she began promoting a novel named American Dirt for her book club. Oprah said that the book woke her up and changed the way she views what it means to be a migrant. However, American Dirt was written by a white woman and tells the fictional story of a Mexican mother and her son's journey to the border after the cartel murders her family. And I don't believe that white people can't write about Mexican folks and their struggles, but respect, research, and sensitivity are especially needed if that's the case. Many believe that American Dirt simply did not do that. This was also considered poverty porn, AKA writing about horrific experiences from other people for monetary gain, which I didn't even know that was a subject matter that existed. When this book was released, they featured barbed wire centerpieces at a bookseller dinner and claimed that the author's husband was an undocumented immigrant to imply that she could loosely identify with the story when he immigrated from Ireland, by the way, not from Mexico. The Latino community themselves has spoken out against this, saying that the novel was inauthentic and inaccurate, pointing to various scenes like when the main character encounters an ice rink and is utterly shocked at the existence of said rink. Now, you might go, why is that inauthentic? Well, a variety of reasons, but for one of those reasons, the existence of a rink, when something like, I don't know, winter sports such as ice skating are played in Mexico, like people are aware of what ice skating is. An LA Times writer, Esmeralda Bermudez, even went so far as to state, "'In 17 years of journalism, in interviewing thousands of immigrants, I've never come across anyone like American Dirt's main character. She's this middle-class bookstore-owning woman who left Mexico with a small fortune in her pocket like she was going to France or something. With inheritance money, with an ATM to her mom's life savings. And why did she leave? Because she was flirting with a drug lord who's now trying to kill her. This is a wonderful melodramatic telenovela, something I would love to watch for cheap entertainment, like a narco thriller on Netflix. 
but this should not be called by anyone, the great immigrant novel, the story of our time, the grapes of wrath. Why? How did we get to a point in our industry, in the book industry, in society, that this is the low standard that we have? And I apologize for the lengthy quote here, but I think it is important to understand why the novel simply did not resonate with the Latino community. Oprah admitted she didn't actually look for Latino writers for genuine, real, authentic voices, despite having advertised this as a story that represents real immigration. If Oprah had advertised this as a melodramatic telenovela, as the writer put, then perhaps she wouldn't have gotten such flack for that. Instead, people were frustrated that Oprah would use her platform like this. As one of the most influential women in the world, wouldn't she, of all people, be able to find a book that better represents a Mexican immigrant story? This American Dirt example is largely on par with the controversies we're going to talk about today. Because from what I've seen in my research, Oprah isn't so much a malicious person as she is a negligent one. So let's get into why that is. So how did Oprah gain all this power in the first place? And how does she use it? I'm not gonna go over every stage of her career, but give just a brief overview so we're all on generally the same page. Oprah was born in 1954 and at age 19, got her first television job at CBS at a station in Nashville, Tennessee. A few years later in 1976, she transferred to an ABC affiliate in Baltimore, Maryland. Investopedia says that she defected to a morning talk show in 77 after struggling to maintain the objectivity required to report the news and her casual improvisational style served her well on talk shows. It served her so well, in fact, that she was offered a 30 minute morning talk show in 1984 called AM Chicago. Within a year, it became vastly popular and film critic Roger Ebert soon encouraged her to license her own show. Oprah did exactly that, renaming her program The Oprah Winfrey Show and expanding it to last an hour. Oprah was the first African-American nationally syndicated TV host at only 32 years old, which is super impressive. From there, the expansion continued steadily. She launched Harpo Inc., a major studio, and became the richest woman in entertainment in 1995 with a $340 million net worth. And I feel like this is pretty obvious, but I love it every time. It's just like a little fun fact. Harpo is just Oprah spelled backwards. And I don't know why, but I just, I love that. Anyway, in 1998, she co-founded Oxygen Media, a programming company. And when the Oprah Winfrey show reached its end in 2011, she created OWN, the Oprah Winfrey Network. Whether you love or hate Oprah or fall somewhere in the middle and you're not sure how to feel, there's no denying her massive and incredible achievements in television. She's been admired by many for being self-made and rising up despite a difficult childhood and has been named the most influential celebrity multiple times. And that's even after she dropped off daily television in 2011. There really is no understating her influence and popularity. But as the old saying goes, remember with great power, responsibility. Over the years, some have argued that Oprah has been anything but responsible with the people she promotes. This doesn't mean she's culpable for their actions per se, but for giving them a platform. I've spoken about how Oprah discovered Dr. Phil in my first episode devoted to him. But for those of you that may not be aware, Oprah first met Dr. Phil when she was taken to court by the cattle industry. On her program, Oprah had labeled beef a dangerous food, warning Americans that they could potentially get mad cow disease if they ate it. She asked her audience, quote, "'Now, doesn't that concern you all a little bit right there hearing that? It has just stopped me cold from eating another burger. I'm stopped,' end quote." A group of cattle industry executives said that her comments had lost them $10 million in business, but the jury decided in Oprah's favor, leading her to make the statement, "'Free speech not only lives, it rocks.'" Oprah was within her free speech rights to say this, and Dr. Phil, as a jury consultant, had impressed her so much that he was invited onto her show. He became one of Winfrey's most popular guests, and soon Dr. Phil's own career took off. Now, whether or not Oprah knew about Phil McGraw's questionable past, I have no idea. Yet what is clear here is the fact that she gave him a ringing endorsement, bringing him into the spotlight along with her. She did the same for Dr. Oz, who also has his own episode here. Now, Oprah first invited Dr. Oz to be a guest health expert on her program in 2004. And soon, like Dr. Phil, he became popular enough to essentially earn his own spinoff, The Dr. Oz Show. So what exactly is the problem with endorsing doctors like these? Well, let's get into some of the values we've seen Oprah promote on her show. And if there were any warning signs about who Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz would become. 
I watched an old 2002 The Oprah Winfrey Show episode where Dr. Phil helps a couple having miscommunication issues. The show opens up by giving Erica and Eric's perspectives. And yes, they're named Erica and Eric. So I apologize in advance for the confusion there. Erica says that despite having graduated summa cum laude from law school, she feels that her husband treats her like an idiot. And Eric admits that he frequently says things he doesn't mean in an attempt to win an argument. I'll admit, I was honestly pleasantly surprised. I've said how Dr. Phil has been criticized for being judgmental and tearing people down. But in this episode, he did largely seem to encourage these couples to talk to one another as opposed to judging them. He sounded a lot more like a mediator versus a judge. There are a few moments though that just aren't questionable, but downright laughably terrible. Dr. Phil tells one couple with communication issues that their language sets aren't really compatible. According to him, women speak to men and want the same level of communication and understanding as if they're speaking to their girlfriends at a slumber party. This isn't a slumber party and he's not one of your girlfriends. Dr. Phil explains this to women and I quote, he speaks testosterone, you speak estrogen. I won't list the reasons why this is absolutely fucking ridiculous because we'd be here forever, but needless to say, testosterone and estrogen are not languages, last I was aware. During his early years featured on the Oprah television show, Dr. Oz also gave some questionable advice. I found an episode from 2006 where Dr. Oz says that what your stool sounds like when it hits the water will tell you information about your colon health. It should hit the water like a diver from Acapulco hits the water. (laughs) And I get that like, yeah, if your stool has blood in it or is a really unusual color, or if you're having an unusual bowel movements, like you should see your doctor, but like, the sound? There's some truth mixed in with misleading statements here as we've seen before in his episodes. I don't see much difference between Dr. Oz of today and how he acted in 2006. So take that as you want. There are also two women that come onto the program. One claims she often doesn't have a bowel movement for five days. She only drinks diet soda and the other who also claims to not drink water and have hemorrhoids that are so bad they can leave her bedridden for two days. Frankly, I think they need to go to their physician, not a talk show doctor. He just tells them to eat fiber and drink water before Oprah begins advocating for a whole grain fad diet. And as an aside, it was kind of gross and it was kind of mocking how Oprah keeps calling one of the women with constipation tiny marbles in reference to her stool as a joke throughout the episode. It kind of had to watch it to see it, but it just was, it was strange. The tiny marble. <laughs> However, his actions about halfway into the program aren't just questionable, but incredibly concerning. Oprah and Dr. Oz start talking about blood pressure and claim they had nurses measure the blood pressure of everyone in the audience that day. One woman, Ruth, allegedly had a blood pressure of 250 over 120, which Dr. Oz states should scare her. Uh, That's this number that scares me and it ought to scare you. Now, that number shouldn't just scare this audience member, but that number is way over the necessary threshold, which is 180 over 120, that warrants calling 911 for a hypertensive crisis. Dr. Oz again says that there are so many Americans who have the exact same number, implying that it's just normal, when again, they need to seek medical treatment if it's really that high. Needless to say, there were at least warning signs about the questionable advice from Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz right from the beginning. While neither one of them was as controversial back then as they are now, the fact that Oprah has continued to promote them has been upsetting for many, especially given their advice surrounding the pandemic. Articles calling for Oprah to denounce Dr. Oz and Dr. Phil during the pandemic started circulating around mid 2020. Some argued that Oprah is responsible for cleaning up her own messes and neither doctor would be a household name if it were not for her. While their actions on their own programs are incredibly controversial, the way they presented themselves during the pandemic was frankly disgusting. Dr. Oz appeared on Fox and Friends and overstated the power of the study that sparked the hydroxychloroquine conversation and the potential of it being a treatment for COVID. Dr. Phil appeared on another Fox program, Laura Ingram's show, and questioned the need for social distancing during the start of the pandemic. And even if I were to give them the benefit of the doubt and say that during the early months of the pandemic, we really didn't know much about COVID, both Dr. Oz and Dr. Phil were grossly irresponsible to present themselves as good sources of information. This is not their field of expertise and therefore they should have deferred to actual expert opinions, but they liked their own better. While some comments and tweets tagged Oprah after the doctor's comments telling her to speak out, others insisted she isn't responsible for the nonsense they are spewing. There have been some news that Oprah may not agree with Dr. Oz though. So I want all the girls watching here and now to know 
that a new day is on the horizon. Rumors circulated that Oprah intended to run for president in 2020, but she eventually said she wasn't cut out for it and did not run. Dr. Oz, on the other hand, did enter the political sphere and is actually currently running for Senator of Pennsylvania as of writing this. And it's not entirely clear if he actually has Oprah's support or not, as she's given what the independent calls an awkward statement on the matter. She said, "'One of the great things about our democracy is that every citizen can decide to run for public office. Mehmet Oz made that decision. And now it's up to the residents of Pennsylvania to decide who will represent them. This isn't really a message of support, even if it's not denouncing him either. The prospect of Dr. Oz running for Senate in Pennsylvania may have seemed ridiculous years ago, but as we're witnessing once again, celebrity and influence can certainly win out over experience. As of writing this, he's actually a front runner in the race, though it's still a little too soon to say. And again, I understand that Oprah is not responsible for either Dr. Oz or Dr. Phil's actions, but she does have Dr. Phil's program available on her website and through her network. And that is her choice, not his. It's also her choice to keep Suzanne Summers' health advice on her website too. Back in 2009, Oprah was criticized for bringing Suzanne Summers onto her show. Summers isn't a doctor and she hasn't gone to medical school, yet she's advocated for BHRT, biological hormone replacement therapy, and takes about 60 supplements a day. She claims to have her blood chemically cleaned with chelation therapy if she's exposed to cigarette smoke and makes even more wild statements about how hormones can treat almost anything in the female body. Oprah, rather than caution her audience about going to such extremes said, quote, many people write Suzanne off as a quackadoo, but she might just be a pioneer. Oprah acknowledged that Suzanne has been criticized by doctors yet continued to advocate for her on her program. In her magazine, Oprah told readers that she went on bioidentical estrogen after reading Summer's book and after three days said that the skies were bluer and her brain was no longer fuzzy. For Oprah to advocate for Suzanne Summers may not only be irresponsible, but once again, it crosses into dangerous territory. You see, years ago, Suzanne Summers and other sources seem to imply that she treated her breast cancer in an all natural way. In 2001, WebMD reported that she was treating it with a drug made from mistletoe extract, while MedPage Today says she declined chemotherapy. In more recent years, articles have argued this simply isn't the case. Summers was treated with a lumpectomy and radiation therapy. Summers just declined a follow-up post-cancer chemotherapy that doctors may prescribe for extra assurance. This doesn't mean she cured her cancer with mistletoe extract, so for her to imply such a thing is extremely misleading. It's great that she's feeling better and looking healthy, but to imply that it's because of hormone therapy and seemingly not mention or understate that she did undergo radiation therapy is a bit messed up. It also comes across like, well, she's trying to sell you something. With MLMs, I've seen numerous times how sellers will lose weight and act as if it's all thanks to Herbalife or Thrive or whatever product they use and neglect to talk about their diet and exercises. And that's part of what got me into talking about MLMs in the first place. One of my friends did that with the Thrive Company and it really angered and disgusted me. Summer seems to have taken a similar step with something as life-threatening as cancer, unfortunately. In actuality, Summers likely looks young from a combination of things like hair dye, Botox, collagen filters, and possibly a stem cell facelift. If you want plastic surgery, of course, that's fine. That's your choice. And I'm not gonna judge her for making that choice. But to imply it's due to an unproven treatment that she treats like a cure-all in order to appear like a medical professional, I'm definitely gonna judge the hell out of her for that one. Summers and the doctors aren't the only ones with controversial, dangerous opinions that have appeared on the Oprah show. In 2007, Jenny McCartney also appeared on Oprah's program and told her audience that she is certain her son contracted autism from the MMR vaccine. She said, I said to the doctor, I have a very bad feeling about this shot. This is the autism shot, isn't it? And he said, no, that is ridiculous. It is a mother's desperate attempt to blame something on autism. And he swore at me. The nurse gave Evan the shot and not soon thereafter, McCartney said, boom, soul gone from his eyes. Jenny McCartney was one of the largest voices in what she calls the pro-safe vaccine movement, instead of calling it the anti-vaccine movement, which is what it is. She also believes that autism can be reversed when you remove wheat and dairy from a child's diet and told PBS Frontline that within two weeks, he had better eye contact and sentence structure. McCarthy also added vitamins into his diet, which she claims helped his tantrums and has called aluminum a devil in vaccines. She said that she wouldn't vaccinate again should she have another child. Now I've gone into the anti-vax movement at length. And if I were to go off on just how angry this makes me, we would be here way too long. We'd be here forever. So 
how does this relate to Oprah? She's not the one saying these things, right? Well, she's not, but she is giving them a platform to say these things to millions of people. Not only did Oprah have her views on air, but Oprah's production company signed McCarthy on for a talk show of her own, literally handing a platform to her on a silver platter. How is that not an endorsement? The potentially syndicated series fell through though, but McCarthy isn't the only one who spread anti-vaccine information on Oprah's program. And before we continue on to even two more expert doctors on Oprah's shows, let's take a quick break to thank today's sponsors. You know what's something we use almost every single day? Cell phones. Cell phones are everywhere. And for some of us, they are very, very expensive to maintain every single month. So it's a huge relief to find savings where you can, and you can find one of these with Mint Mobile because Mint Mobile is the first wireless company to sell online only, and their lack of overhead translates into serious savings for you. Their plans start at just $15 a month, and all their plans come with unlimited talk, text, and high-speed data, all delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. And with Mint Mobile, you can choose the amount of data that's right for you and stop paying for all the data you don't use. I'm going on two years of using Mint Mobile now, and ever since I switched, I have never looked back. My bills are clear, there's no surprises, I know exactly what I'm paying for every single month, and I can change it as I need it, which is also really sick. And by the way, there's no dropped calls, missed texts, any of that crap. It's all there, always. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, make sure you go to mintmobile.com slash casket. That's mintmobile.com slash casket. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash casket. This episode's also sponsored by Purple Mattress because there's no sleep like good sleep. And it seems like we've all been really focused on sleep lately too because no one is getting good sleep. But no matter how much stuff and other weird sleeping products you buy, nothing really helps more than the basics, getting a better mattress. That's why it's worth investing in a Purple Mattress because only Purple Mattresses offer the Gel Flex Grid, which is a super stretchy, ultra squishy material that adapts and flexes around pressure points and doesn't retain heat. The Gel Flex Grid supports your back and legs, yet also cushions your shoulders, neck, and hips. It's comfy where you need it to be, and it's a little more rigid where you need it to be too. And let me tell you what, I recently moved and now the place that I live in runs really, really warm in the bedroom. And I'm usually a cold sleeper, right? So if it's hot for me, it is hot. And my purple mattress and my purple pillows have really been helping kind of dissipate that heat at night and keep me more room temperature. Getting a great night's sleep starts with having a great mattress. So get a purple mattress. Go to purple.com slash casket and use code casket. For a limited time, you can get 10% off any order of $200 or more. That's purple.com slash casket, code casket for 10% off any order of $200 or more. Purple.com slash casket, promo code casket. Terms apply. Dr. Christiane Northrup, one of Oprah's regular experts, said she was a little against her own profession and advised against everyone getting the HPV vaccine. Instead, she said that getting on a good dietary program to enhance immunity was a better idea as people died after getting the HPV vaccine. Simply because someone dies after receiving or doing something doesn't mean it was that thing's fault. That's like blaming the HPV vaccine for someone who died after being hit by a bus. Correlation does not equal causation. That doesn't mean the vaccine is at fault. So saying, oh, 32 out of millions of people died after getting the vaccine is extremely misleading. And yes, those deaths were researched and found to have no correlation. Cult researcher, Matthew Remsky, who's followed Northrop's career has weighed in on the matter. And he said, she was able to go from a fairly straight laced gynecologist with a legitimate practice and the social status that came with it to branching out to national and international network of new age publishing and conferences. When she came out with women's bodies, women's wisdom, she is playing this edge between offering fairly conventional medical advice and also opening her audience up to the idea that Chinese herbs and acupuncture might also be effective. It was gradual how Northrop started to fall from grace, but Oprah endorsed her and platform Northrop when she started to go downhill. She let an anti-vaccine message spread yet again. And in recent years, Northrop has even been called the doctor of disinformation, and she's begun promoting extreme conspiracies in regards to the pandemic, aligning herself with QAnon. Remsky says that she began functioning as a gateway between the QAnon world and the more mainstream circles, as her message became darker and more conspiratorial. Although Press Herald claims that she once graced Oprah Winfrey's show, implying that she hasn't been on Oprah's show for a while, her advice has been questionable for ages. She spread disinformation so much that her Instagram was blocked for misinformation. 
Yet somehow we are still not done talking about the questionable doctors Oprah has endorsed. Dr. Prudence Hall, referred to as the doctor to the stars by the LA Times, was placed on probation in 2018 for touting plant-based hormones without being aware of the potential risks, such as cancer. Dr. Hall has worked with celebrity patients like Cindy Crawford and unsurprisingly, Suzanne Somers. Small world, right? Well, Hall has spoken on the Oprah Winfrey network before, claiming that it's not about age, it's about how healthy your hormones are in 2011. Her message about not aging and natural relief from menopause symptoms like hot flashes, night sweats, and loss of libido are appealing to Oprah's audience. The median O Magazine reader is 49 years old, FYI, and Oprah's core audience is typically women around that age. Yet Dr. Hall's claims and treatments don't have evidence backed behind them. Once again, making me wonder what sort of vetting process anyone actually has to go through or credentials they have to have to appear on OWN. Could I just make up credentials and suddenly be on OWN as well? Now, this by no means are the only questionable people that have appeared on Oprah's shows. While it's one thing to give these views a platform, it's another when Oprah has defended them. Seth Mnookin, director of MIT's science writing program, published a book called The Panic Virus, which discusses anti-vaxxer appearances on Winfrey's show. He gave what I'd say is a pretty fair assessment of the situation and stated the following. Oprah is an interesting figure, and she has clearly been a really positive force in many ways. I think public health is not one of those ways, and it's not just around vaccines. When Oprah's been criticized, she said that her guests are just sharing first-person stories to inform the audience and put a human face on topics relevant to them. Her intention is allegedly that she's just trying to present the information in an interesting way, not to endorse it. In my opinion, this comes across as favoring anecdotal evidence regardless of intent. And I think I've made it clear how I feel about anecdotal evidence. It shouldn't be taken too seriously until there's facts and studies to back it up. So if Oprah wants to put this information out there, she at least needs to argue it and challenge dangerous misinformation, but she seemingly doesn't. According to a 2018 Mother Jones article, Oprah's own views on vaccination still are not all that clear, which could potentially make her audience believe that Oprah herself actually does agree with McCarthy and other doctors featured on her show. I don't want to presume what Oprah thinks, but if I were speaking to an anti-vaxxer on this platform, I'd be arguing their points and making it very clear that I believe their viewpoint is dangerous. And it all comes back to today's word of the day, responsibility. Is Oprah responsible for her guests believing that vaccines can cause autism or that social distancing is unnecessary? Absolutely not. But she is responsible for giving them a platform and allowing that misinformation to spread via that platform. Now, I can't speak to Oprah's intent, but the fact that it's happened numerous times and consistently, and that she hasn't really spoken out and denounced any of them, it at the very least seems like she doesn't care about the issue. Now that we've seen the people Oprah has promoted, let's talk about the projects Oprah has worked on. One that comes to mind that's faced numerous controversies is her school located in Africa. Now, before we continue, I wanna give a brief content warning here because this next portion will mention sexual assault and a deceased child. There won't be graphic descriptions, but just skip the rest of the episode if this is gonna be upsetting to you because this last portion is going to be quite a tough portion to digest. Now, for those of you still here and for those that don't know, Oprah has her own charitable foundation called the Oprah Foundation that claims to be big on education, especially in the continent of Africa. I've spoken about short-term mission trips before and how simply building a school and abandoning it is not necessarily helping a community, but Oprah wanted to build a long-term solution to level the playing field, as she puts it. The site even adds that South African president Nelson Mandela himself was on board with this idea, and after they discussed it, the pair began working to make it a reality. In 2007, the Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy for Girls opened, and almost immediately, people began questioning how exactly this luxury school could level anything. This school has large dorms with 200 thread count sheets, a yoga studio, a beauty salon, indoor and outdoor theaters, hundreds of pieces of original tribal art, over 20 lush acres of land and 28 buildings. Celebrities like Julia Roberts, John Travolta, and Angelina Jolie all attended the grand opening. And in my opinion, there's absolutely no problem with having a lush, spacious, beautiful school that costs $40 million and is free to attend. And seriously, it gorgeous, free, school, incredible, that's great, that's awesome. And I think that if Oprah built a school that wasn't beautiful, she undoubtedly would have been given flack for that. So I also understand that there is an aesthetic point of view for the outsider looking in as well. I understand there's a little more to the appearance than just how the students feel that are there. However, 
I can understand the concern about the potential elitism too. Allegedly, only 12 to 13 year old African girls could apply and there were only 152 spots available. Over 3,500 girls applied, leaving the school with just a 4% acceptance rate, a rate lower than many other prestigious schools and less than half of Harvard's. 152 spots, that was it. Oprah herself conducted interviews of the 500 finalists searching for girls with the it factor. And that it factor was girls that wanted to change the world. Still, this was too much for the South African government. This was supposed to be a collaborative effort between them and Oprah, but when more and more people began to question the school's luxury, they pulled out. One journalist at the time said it was Hogwarts with the Martha Stewart makeover. Another South African school official said that the country is very obviously poor, so it wasn't hard to see why many people felt that what Oprah was doing was too much. Oprah responded by saying she wanted to take on girls with an it quality and give them an opportunity to make a difference. I'd like to think I have as much good sense as I have money, so that's a lot of good sense, she stated. And this is where Oprah loses me completely. And of course, this is my opinion, so feel free to take it or leave it. But if you go to a country with high poverty rates to build a school and brag about your money, then I just, how could I respect that? It's just like, hey, I'm supposed to be doing this good and it makes me look good too. But by the way, um, I have a lot of good sense because I have a lot of good money. Having lots of money does not make you a good person. Literally look at any modern day oligarch. Most of them are bad people. And I only say most of them because I haven't looked into every single oligarch that's out there all around the world. So I can't blanket statement it, but chances are if I did look through it, I'd probably find a vast majority, if not all of them were probably bad. Now, not to mention when it comes to the school, Oprah was actually the one who conducted interviews with the girls, determining if she would let them in, seemingly based on subjective criteria. She searched for this it quality among these kids and picked ones she liked best. Again, how is that leveling of any kind? Allegedly, she let one girl in simply because she had moxie and asked Oprah if it really cost her $500 to get her eyebrows done. Honestly, I think this is disgusting and performative. Oprah, in essence, went to an impoverished community where one eighth of the population is HIV positive and told them whoever she liked best would get an education. And the other seven eighths of the population just get fucked because I didn't like you. I just, I, I don't really have words to describe why I dislike this so much. I just really don't. But yeah, Oprah built a school and that's great. But the way in which she went about it leaves such a bad taste in my mouth. Now, while much of the early criticism about the school's elitism and luxury was one thing, the school soon faced a controversy on another scale when in October, 2007, a dorm matron was accused of sexual assault and violence against the students. Oprah herself flew out to the school to meet with parents and allegedly gave students her personal phone number. According to Time, she also called it one of the most devastating experiences of her life and said that all things happen for a reason. And personally, i.e. personal opinion here, if a young student at a school named after me were sexually assaulted, I wouldn't tell them everything happens for a reason, but again, that's just my opinion. Oprah also gave the girls counseling and fired all the dorm matrons at the school. Oprah told parents at the school and explained in a media conference that the headmistress, whose name I'm about to say, but I'm going to probably butcher just, just horrifically, and I apologize for that. The headmistress, Lorado Nomvuyo Mizamane, had not taken abuse concerns seriously. She apparently required students to be fearful and silent, according to Oprah, and the headmistress too was fired. However, while it's important to take abuse allegations seriously, the headmistress alleged that Oprah was actually defaming her by saying such things as it simply was not the case. Not to mention the dorm matron that was accused of abuse was actually acquitted of any wrongdoing during an investigation. The case left her humiliated, broke, and unemployed, though she was acquitted and Oprah claimed she was disappointed in the outcome, but proud of the nine girls who testified at trial. Now, I have no idea if these nine girls were abused or not, and I won't speculate or insist that they must've been lying. I don't think Oprah was overreacting by how seriously she took the matter, as cases like these do need to be taken seriously. Yet her comments about the headmistress seemed to be without proof or merit, as she later filed a defamation suit and then settled with Oprah for an undisclosed amount of money. It's hard to know for sure exactly what happened here, but this certainly was not the school's only controversy to come. In 2009, seven pupils were disciplined for offenses relating to sexual misconduct. And in 2011, a deceased infant was found in a bag of one of the school's students. It's believed that the 17 year old student gave birth at the school and she was soon brought to a hospital where she was being treated for excessive bleeding. This isn't necessarily a scandal. Schools have had issues, but Oprah's school, given that her name is attached, is going to make headlines. The Daily Maverick makes this point and I do understand the perspective. 
While there have been rumors floating around that the school is strict or like a prison, there aren't any reputable reports about it either. Truly, I am happy for those girls that have graduated from Oprah's Academy and are going on to do wonderful things and even earn their PhD. That's fantastic and I do truly wish them the best. All in all today, it's not so much about Oprah's direct actions that have made me infuriated, but it's more about her lack of awareness, lack of responsibility, and her ignorance. Oprah is by no means the worst person we've ever spoken about here in episodes, but I can't in good faith support her when these types of behaviors continue as well. But again, these are just my thoughts, information that I've gathered, and some of my opinions sprinkled in. And that is where we're gonna end today's episode. Thank you for spending some of your time here with me today. I really do appreciate it. I know you have so much you can be doing in a single day and yet you chose to give some of your ears time with me. So that was really weirdly spoken. I don't know why I said it like that, but I think you'll get my point. Thank you for hanging out with today's episode, learning a little bit more about Oprah. I hope you learned something new and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. 